Alright, so... I don't acknowledge that. <laughs> so, I gave you a essay to read tonight, which is actually going to be a chapter in a new book that's coming out later this summer. With Columbia University Press, entitled Force and Exception. Um, and the subtitle is Political Theology and the Crisis of Liberal Democracy. Now, uh, this particular essay is not you know, going to give away the whole show of what's going on in there. Um, and it, it was written subsequently to the manuscript, which is now the book, which you are assigned to read for next week, uh, in the title Postmodernism and the Revolution of Religious Theory, which is a kind of bland title. And the only reason that it's a bland title was the title I wanted to use was uh, Event Horizon, which is a metaphor from theoretical physics, which you, when you get into the book, you kind of see why it's important. Uh, but uh, the, my publisher, in their wisdom, thought that well, maybe that term was a little esoteric, and of course their motto for choosing titles, which is common in publishing these days, is that if a catalog librarian doesn't know what it means, you can't use that title. Uh, so it's now called Postmodernism and the Revolution of Religious Theory. Well, what we're going to talk tonight about is theory as the exception to the That's what this you know, essay is about, what I call force and exception. Theory is the exception to the rule. And say the rule, right? We all live by rules, but as academics, we all want to break rules, right? You know, ever since Foucault talked about, you know, the you know, the power that that we, we don't want to live under hegemonic structures, and we don't want to, in some ways, be dupes of hidden power complexes and relationships. So, you know, therefore, we want to transgress. We want to be disruptive. We want to be um, this, you know, uh, dissipative, perhaps, to use Derrida's terms. We, we don't want to do it in an overt way. The 60s is long gone. We don't want to just say burn, baby, burn, and bring the system down because we know we can't do that. But we still love to subvert. We want to subvert within it. Of course, what we don't realize is subversion is going on all the time. It's going on within the very kind of structures and codes of language that we use on a day to day basis. In other words, to what uh, the psychoanalyst Lacan calls the symbolic order. The symbolic order, which it has its own kind of autonomy and reigns over our discourse because it is a possibility of saying certain things and not certain, certain things. We don't have any choice in it. None of us really, I mean, we can learn to speak a foreign language, but if we grew up learning English, that was our kind of uh, mother tongue, and that we learned at the feet of our mother, you know, when we first said mama and so forth. You know, that, that, that is wired into our brain, and that's how we think. That is, a, that is a structural grammar, that is a system of codes, that is an order of acceptable signification that we, you know, have no recourse to. We have to live within it. We can, we can create alternative universes of language, but we have to work out, we have to struggle at it, and even then, we're still subservient to the hegemonic order of that alternate language and so forth. So the linguistic, the symbolic, the structure of signifying action and possibility, all that is something in which we are all inherently, naturally servants, if not abject slaves. This is one of the realizations, perhaps, of this a uh, whole uh, revolution in theoretical perspectives. We already talked about a little bit when looking at Foucault that we, uh, that we call structuralism and so forth. 
So in other words, that we can only say certain things, we can only know certain things, we can only understand certain things, okay? Now, there's one thing that we understand by the linguistic, or the symbolic. And remember, if, if you want to go to a, a, a thinker like Lacan, who are not reading in this course, but who sort of hovers there, whenever you're dealing with post-structuralism, uh, Lacan is like this you know, cloud that you know, hovers in the distance, sort of like the pillar of fire as the Israelites are wandering through the desert. No, Lacan's ministrations and, and thoughts and provocations and so forth, none of which you will probably ever experience directly, directly because you couldn't, you know, you would rebel if you actually had to read Lacan. Uh, you know, we, we can read him in little segments. And of course, in my seminar of the spring, we'll, we'll read a little bit of Lacan. But Lacan is like the sort of background noise of all of contemporary theoretical discourse. In, in many respects. And what and what's in some ways epitomizes, if not distinguishes Lacan from other thinkers, is his realization that reality, the term is all about, right? Now it's really getting down to the nitty-gritty, you know. We've been we've been talking about all these kind of extrinsic, you know, orders and templates and frameworks and so forth. But now we want to get to that which really is in some kind of profound, gripping, you know, incommensurable, undeniable, ontological sense, which we call the real. But according to Lacan, the real is something that doesn't appear to us. It's not something that is easily won, because most of us, as slaves, to the linguistic or the symbolic. You know, we don't want to let the real in. We want the world to be peachy keen, you know, smooth, seamless, streamlined, according to our orders of discourse and language. You know, we want to say what it is. What is, what is a phenomenon like political, political correctness? Political correctness is a fantasy. It's a collective hypnotic fantasy of people who want a certain moral order and therefore to define a certain moral order and define those who somehow violate or unsettle the moral order is on the outside, you know, and say, well, therefore you have to look in. The principle of exclusion and of expurgation, if not exile, using the word exclusion in a transitory sense. The principle of, of exilic exclusion is inherent in the nature of the symbolic. We don't want to be bothered by things that don't fit with our order of reality, no matter how moral, no matter how true, no matter how scientific they do. This past week, I've spent a lot of time following the news of the Ebola crisis. It's called something crisis, or, or is, it a panic? is it a moral panic? That's another kind of, you know, smug, you know, academic term that's been developed. People get upset about things. Well, we academics know they shouldn't panic. Because after all, in our symbolic order, this is the way the thing is laid out. You know, and, and, and part. What, what are you saying? The, 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 the primary grammatical meme of the symbolic order is this phrase, we know. Or even more importantly, science says. I mean, have you been, have you been, have you been paying attention to the, like, the discourse of officialdom in Washington? Not to say that they're wrong, they're not necessarily right either, because they that they said soothing and assuring things over and over that it proved to be sort of ambiguous or not quite so reassuring and so forth. But no, according to science, or science says, or we know because we are scientists, the cons to go beyond this, the consensus of science, the consensus of those who, in a sense, are the high priesthood of the symbolic order. You know, just like the 
the temple priest or the Sanhedrin that didn't like what this kind of radical long-haired Galilean was saying 2,000 years ago, you know, talking about messiahship and the nature of Torah in ways that weren't necessarily all of that. We, we don't like people that somehow upset the symbolic order by, you know, unnerving the system of authorization, okay? Uh, so, we're, we're talking about rules here. The symbolic order is, in some ways, the ontology of rules. The hegemony of rules. The hegemony which says that the only thing which really is can only be determined as that which really is in accordance with the system of regulative language. And the regulative language that is authorized by those who set the rules of language, including the premier theorists, those who in a sense are what we call the canonical thinkers, those who have in a sense gone before us, the ancients our predecessors, our precursors, the giants on whose shoulders we stand. In other words, those who have spoken well and have spoken before us. The funny thing about knowledge is that knowledge only that progresses and advances, ironically, if we don't follow the rules. The history of the arts is about those who learned the rules and realized the rules were inadequate. I have a personal anecdote that, that this really sunk in quite a number of years ago when I was chair of the department. And we had a case, it was a personnel case, and it was a big one involved or something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. But there was a certain uh, set of guidelines about who could take sabbaticals under what circumstances and so forth. And this faculty member had applied uh, to for a sabbatical. You know that 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 was transgressive of the guidelines. And I, as the department chair, said, "Well, the guidelines say you can't do it this way." And I took it to the dean, and the dean overruled me. He said, no, this person can do it. I said, well, what do you mean? You're the dean. You know, you're this kind of, you know, material incarnation of authority of the rules. And you're telling me that the rules don't matter here? You especially, you're the dean. You know, you're higher than me. You know, you can overrule me. And I'm obeying the rules, and you who are the, you know, the... The, the papal uh, numinosity behind the rules are telling me that the rules don't matter. And he looked at me with a smile and he said, well, I guess, you know, because I am the dean, I can tell you this. There are rules, but there are exceptions to the rule. And when the exception to the rule rules, the exception becomes the rule. Now that was kind of mortifying in a lot of ways. It, was, it, 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 it kind of cut through my sense of self-importance as a department chair and so forth. But I realized there was a kind of wisdom to that because in, in some ways authority is not about enforcing the rules. Authority is about looking for the exception to the rule. There's a famous you know, story in the Gospels about Jesus. Now, who, who are the New Testament scholars? Do we have any? Some New Testament scholars? Wait. He is? You, you bow to them, right? <laughs> so, you, uh, in, in Jesus' time, who were the people that were sort of the custodians of the rules? Jesus got in a lot of discussions. Different authorities, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah, Pharisees, Sadducees, right, and so forth. And, uh, you know, and there's that line about Jesus um, 
Jesus spoke with authority, or the Greek word is exousia, you know, unlike the scribes and Pharisees. Now, if you look at the word exousia, it means, in, 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 in some ways, it has a connotation in the ancient Greek of one who can, in a sense, exert, exert their influence to, in a sense, impress upon the rules, or in a sense, create rules because of their own authority. Um, they, they, have, they have the power of declaration. And that's what it's basically saying, is that Jesus spoke with a higher authority, an authority that goes beyond the rule, the one that can, in a sense, speak with the particular force. What I, in this article, I've given you tonight, call it the force of exception, can speak confidently with the force that overrules the rule. So, what I, what I want to kind of get into tonight a little bit is about when we're looking at the question of religion, theoretically, are we looking at the various theories that have sort of laid out the rules, the kind of normative principles of judgment where I can say religion is this and religion is that, those which in many ways establish religion as a kind of ontology, as a kind of essentiality? Uh, which are always determined according to the rule-based algorithm of language. What is religion? Well, we know religion when we see it because it's this, this, and what. What if religion were not what follows the rule, but religion were what was the exception to the rule? What if not religion, but the religious was, or came down the question of, that mysterious singular force, what somebody like Lacan and one of his profound philosophical interpreters like Slavoj Zizek, you know, would, would understand as the real, as that which in a sense breaks the rules of the rule. The rule the the rule of the real is that which ultimately shatters the rule. So we're talking about this notion of exception, okay? Somebody tell me what you think the word exception means. What we, a lot of us who have kind of read post-colonial literature, I mean, it's kind of a cliche among academics to knock something we call American exceptionalism. So what is exceptionalism as opposed to normativity or ordinariness? Being out of sync with the norm. Okay, or transgressing with common opinion, with, you know, what Jefferson called a common and decent opinion of mankind. Maybe even not sub not subject to the norm. Uh, okay. It's not, is it necessarily not subject to the norm, or is in some ways realizing the norms, carrying through the norms? Remember, no criminal is ever a criminal. No one who ever violates the rules is really violating the rules per se. What is violating what they consider to be idolatrous or false material rules? When, you know, when Jesus, when Jesus is confronted, that Jesus on the line tonight. When Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees when he and his disciples are, you know, eating, uh, you know, you know, eating sheaves of wheat on the Sabbath, what does it say? Go on the stomach. You've read the Bible, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sabbath was not made for man. That was man for the Sabbath. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, when, so in a sense, it's these kind of inverting the rules to say these these rules are missing the point. They've got a whole system of inference that forgets or is ignorant of what the original intention of the meaning, you know, the, the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter of the law, uh, and what have you. Now, what about if, in, in some ways, we were dealing not with the spirit, the law of religion, that is, the theoretical grid, the systemic 
linguistical, conceptual way of reading religion that has been set down, you know, over generations by the Sanhedrin that we call the Religious Studies Academy. But what if there was something intentional, original, behind this theory. What in the sense we can only begin to theorize, as I'm fond of saying, what if we can only begin to theorize from the singular? So the singularity has a force behind it. The, sing the singularity has a power behind it. It is the singular that determines the universal, as L.A. and the New point, you know, argues very effectively in his book on St. Paul, and also in a, in a lot more kind of complex uh, sort of no esoteric way in his book, The Theory of the Subject. What if there is no such thing as the universal per se? What if the universal is in many ways the output, the outgrowth, the kind of routinization, the exteriorization of some kind of essential religious glimpse? Let's even dare call it a revelation. by which new norms are produced, new worlds are generated. New ideas, new philosophies come into being. They, to use Henri Bergson, uh, they sediment and coagulate because of the hot, burning lava of this particular force of this inspiration. What if it was the exception and the force of exception that creates the rule of the universal, which can only, in some ways, only be understood as applying to everybody only because of what somebody like Jacques Derrida in his book Force of Law calls the mystical foundation of authority, which is force in itself. The force of a movement that structures and restructures everything about other things. Does that? Well, let me, let me talk a little bit to see about what it does. As a guy who I've kind of mentioned, but probably you all avoid like the plague, you know, not being philosophers. Or even if you're philosophers, you might not be continental philosophers, and you would definitely avoid it like the plague. I'm talking about this guy. He was a German, and uh, you know, he was a very important German. He's probably the most important German thinker today. And of course, if you're German, you know, Finman uh, Deutschlicht, you know, you would recognize this name. You might even have studied him in high school or gymnasium. His name is Hegel. Anybody ever heard of Hegel? Who is Hegel? Who is Hegel? Timothy, I know you know Hegel. Who is, who is Hegel? George Wilhelm, Richard Hegel? Gale. Gale Bob. Wilhelm, Richard He was a... We've read a guy named Marx already, right? It was, he, he was post-Kantian, right? Like he was responding to Kant. Yeah, he was post-Kantian, right? Yeah. So, I mean, he so, was always trashing Kant. Yeah, so in my 19th, dissertation, I trashed Hegel on Kant. Yeah, yeah. So, so in 19, early 19th century German philosopher who invented the system. The system, right. Right, okay. The system of knowledge. He also invented, now come on, let's go back a few weeks here. Begins with a D. What's the word? Dialectic. Dialectic. And what is the dialectic? Okay. Now, one of the things I uh, talked about a little bit then, but I didn't really go into it, is that you don't have the dialectic except this concept with Hegel himself identifies, which he calls force, or gewalt. Interestingly, this word gewalt in German, G-E-W-A-L-T, is, is one of those ambiguous terms. It has a range of signification that is much broader than it is in English. It can mean force and violence. So in other words, it's not just it's not a term you use in, in rhetoric when, when you're trying
trying to somehow capture the meaning of persuasion. Force is that which, in some ways, is operative in change. You know, it's a, you know the word polemics. What, what are what are polemics? We say something is polemical. A term that goes back to the ancient Greeks. Written against. Hmm? Written against. Right. Polemics are like, you know, hard, <coughs> determined. I mean, it, it, polemics are verbal warfare. And, uh, you know, it was the pre Socratics who understood that polemos, you know, uh, was inherently part of what we call the primordial universe. Polemos is indistinguishable in many ways from logos. And, and, and Hegel was in, somehow able to see that logos only becomes logos when it when when it captures the essence of this force that we call polemos, which was what makes it dialectical, because then when we say one thing, we have to say the opposite. We have to give way. And then we have to give way again. They go call this the negation of the negation, by which we have to get to not a synthesis but a kind of new ground, a new set of positions, a new set of positions where we can incorporate and allow for, in, in some ways, reconcile our way ourselves, if only provisionally, with what we've said before. So it is, it is this stuttering dialectical nature of discourse that allows for philosophy. The polemos that is indigenous to the logo. So, it's, it's in this realm of polemos that we begin to discover what logos means. Polemos is driven by what Hegel calls Gaval. And you'll find all of this. And this is probably the section of Hegel's most important book, The Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, it's the it's the early section, the phenomenology of spirit. It's probably the least read and the most overlooked, and it's probably the most important part of the, of the phenomenology of spirit. Because there, Hegel is basically saying, "Hey, I'm going to talk about the dialectical nature of logos and of reality and discourse, and of the self unfolding and self realization of absolute spirit as." as subjective realization within history, coming to awareness of itself ultimately, as he talked about in his later writings, as philosophy, philosophical comprehension. This notion of the comprehension, not only of the realm of language, but the comprehension of the whole of human reality as memorized experience and so forth, which we call the historical. But that all, in a sense, belongs to this polemical logos that is inherently dialectical, which is driven by this kind of force behind things, this force of every act of signification that a philosopher later, like Derrida, will call the deconstructive moment of the word. In other words, words do not abide. Words do not endure. Hegel called this tearing with the name. Words are always, in a sense, dissociating themselves from themselves. Every linguistic utterance is like Peter after the crucifixion. It is the act of denial. Comprehension. Hegelian synthesis this kind of recognition or realization of what we call the tr what Hegel calls the truth of the whole, let's call it philosophical understanding, is the result of an act of the, the betrayal of the logos itself. It is the cock crowing thrice. The cock throwing thrice, which is fear, anxiety, you know, renunciation, rejection, confusion, doubt, abjection, 
you know, taking yourself out of the situation, self-distancing, all these kind of negative moments or negative elements are part of the polemical nature of logos, which constitutes reality. And it's in these negative moments, it's in these negative moments that what Lacan calls the real that manifests itself. The power of the negative, the negativitates cross, as Hegel calls it, is the key to knowledge. The symbolic, the discursive, the attempt to try to reconcile everything to say, can't you just make it simple to me? You know, forget, forget all this logic. Just give me a little formula. Just give me a little kind of sound bite that I can link on to so I can write it down and say, Yes, I understand. What you don't understand, the minute you wanted to determine it that way, the minute you want to avoid any complexity or difficulty or any conceptual overkill, the minute you want to do that, you're denying the power of knowledge. You're denying the force of knowledge, and ultimately you're dividing, denying, like Peter, the force of truth, which in my new book, with Columbia, I call the force of God. So, we're talking about something called force. And what force produces is something we call exception. Now, can anybody think of a contemporary example of how we might say our kind of comfortable, uh, you know, cozy garden variety touchy-feely, you know, academically respectable, uh, rub up against it and you get a purring sound kind of view of religious as being violated today by what we might call a brutal exception. You know what I'm talking about, you don't who wants the 630 years taking place in the Middle East. ISIS. ISIS. You know, it's really funny because if, if you watch all these nincompoops out there in my field, they're all, they're all bustling around, you know, just kind of saying, oh, this isn't really Islam, this isn't really Islam. You know, of course, when, you know, you have a um, abortion clinic bomber, oh, that's really Christianity, that's really Christianity. You know, you know? or it's like when, when anything gets violent, it's not really religion. Religion... Religion's peaceful, right? All religions are religions of peace, right? You know, in your head, you know, in what Lacan would call your imaginary register, you know, and the imaginary re register, by the way, Lacan is very closely associated with the, reg the register of what he calls the transcendental re reflexivity of, 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 of self-certification. In other words, what we what we we have a flight, or not so in flight term, we call narcissism, you know? It's what I would call, academics are, you know, inherently narcissistic, because they want the world to conform to their idealization. The idealizations they can manage and control, you know, and make sure that nobody, you know, takes their jobs or tenures away, or state legislatures say, these people are teaching kind of dangerous concepts and so forth. No. Religious is the for religion is the force of the real. The religion is the force of the real. It's the force of exception. It's what in my book, which I'll be reading next time, Revolution of Religious Theory, University of Virginia Press, talks about the singularity. The singularity is a black hole. What is a black hole? Anybody ever run up against a black hole lately? Anybody like to run up against a black hole? Anybody have kind of, like these the girls from Colorado that went over over, over to join ISIS? You know, they got apprehended by the FBI in Frankfurt. You know, have you ever had this kind of, you know, either you know strange, weird sort of quasi-erotic fantasy, or maybe it's your totus dream or death drive? You know, you say, yeah, before I die, that's my bucket list. You know, I want to kind of I want to go up to the limits of a black hole, right? Who's the spaceship waiting out there? You don't want to do that. Why not? 
But the problem is, if you see singularities as black holes, in which the concept of the black hole, the singularity that I'm taking theoretically, you know, the black hole is both the source of creativity and also the source of absolute annihilation and destruction. And doesn't that sound a lot like in certain religious traditions, particularly monotheism, even something like Islam? Doesn't that sound like God? You know, take the prophet Isaiah, prophet Isaiah. You know, you know, I create and destroy. Shiva, you know, the you know, the dynamic deity with the waving arms is creating and destroying, brings the plague and also the birth of children. You know, brings worlds into being and brings about their dissolution. Isn't, the, isn't this a law? You know, it is in, in his mercy, you know, sustains the world, but also, you know, is capable of bringing about its absolute ratif ratification. Because as the novelist put it, you know, such a God is defined by potestas absoluta, absolute power the absolute power to bring something into being and to, in a sense, annihilate whatever signifying system we have, whatever theoretical or even theological symbolic order we have to try to make God cozy and manageable and usable for particular needs. Gods, you know, even the pagan gods don't work that way. And I think this is, and we'll, we'll take a break here, I think this is one of the inherent limitations, we might say, of the academic study of religion is that, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, it, it wants to limit our constructions of religion in such a way where we can manipulate the symbolic orders. We all know that religious studies is a field evolved out of colonial administrative systems you know, with written reports, if not spying, you know, uh, you know, you know, kinds of uh, testimonies on the part of missionaries and those who were who were privy to what the natives were really saying or what they were claiming. So they say, well, we we'll make sure that there's, that there's not going to be any kind of unexpected, you know, dark beating of drums in the night. There's not going to be any fire in the village that might signify an uprising, and so forth. You know, that's why we want to administrate religion. We can't administrate religion. And if we understand the theory of religion, which is what we're talking about in this class, as the management of religion, we don't realize that religion rules through the exception of the rule, and that's where we see it at its ontological All right, so that's my sermon for the night. No kind of Pentecostal theatrics. So lots of good scriptural references. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's take a break and then we'll open up discussion.